Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvelous video. When they're not busy breathing fire on you to cook you for a crispy snack, dragons do exude a kind of ethereal beauty. Case in point, Cyrax. When we first met Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen's dragon, the first word that came to our minds was beautiful. Cyrax felt more like Pegasus than a dragon, and that's not just down to her equestrian design. There's a regal aspect to her slender frame and jade green eyes that most other dragons just don't have. Of course, Cyrax is capable of the great fire and fury that is to be expected from her species. Episode 10 was evidence enough of that, but there is another dragon just like her in the series, and her tail is far longer and sadder. Dreamfire was the steed to not one but two queens, and both of their lives, much like her own, ended in tragedy. She has wandered the Seven Kingdoms, birthed dragons, made men marvel at her beauty and more lust for her power. She is a case study in why the Targaryens kept their dragons so close, and this is her origins explored. Also, spoiler warning, because there will be a lot of those in this video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Etymology, birthplace, and early years. Dreamfire is a special dragon because when it comes to pure chronology, she is the second oldest Targaryen dragon at the start of the Dance of the Dragons. When the Targaryens arrived at Dragonstone, they brought with them five dragons, including Balerion. Four of them died, but their eggs hatched Vagar and Meraxes. And with both of them being she-dragons, the House of the Dragon was not going to face a shortage of new hatchlings anytime soon. The first Targaryen dragon to be born after Aegon's conquest quest was Quicksilver, the Mount of Ennis Targaryen, Aegon's eldest son and heir, but the second to be named and bonded with a rider was Dreamfire. Born in the hatcheries of Dragonstone, Dreamfire came into existence during the final years of King Aegon Targaryen's reign. She remained riderless for a number of years until she was claimed by the nine-year-old princess Rhaena Targaryen, who named her slender steed Dreamfire. The name itself is indicative of something deeper, for Rhaena Targaryen was most likely a dragon dreamer. It is said that Princess Rhaena was a shy and dreamy child growing up, given to bonding with animals and fleeing from strange visitors. She continued to be timid up until the moment she was bonded with her hatchling, whom she named herself. As a result, Dreamfire is the second Targaryen dragon to bear a name that is not shared by a Valyrian god or goddess. It was only after Princess Rhaena had bonded with her that her confidence improved. Though she still preferred solitude, none could call Rhaena Targaryen a silent child anymore, and both dragon and rider grew to be fiercely independent yet intrinsically bonded to each other as the years passed. While this isn't proof of Rhaena having been a dragon dreamer, Targaryens who have been described as such have typically tended to be dreamers, and the royal family did not exactly go about advertising their prophetic powers, especially when the citadel at Old Town was trying to replace magic with logic, but that is a debate for another time. When Rhaena had claimed Dreamfire, she was not big enough to ride. However, within three years, the pale blue she-dragon was taken taking her rider for joyrides across Blackwater Bay. And speaking of her coloring, Dreamfire was a dragon who was truly striking. Pale blue, slim, with silver markings, claws, horns, and crest. She was like a cloud in the sky if she rose high enough, and the one thing her rider loved more than her ladies-in-waiting was flying. Rhaena Targaryen had loved her family and friends. She would take her younger brother Aegon flying with her upon Dreamfire, because he hadn't claimed a dragon yet, and had even taken her favorites like Samantha Stockworth and Elaine Royce with her on occasion, but she would most often fly Dreamfire by herself. By the time she turned 16, the princess declared that she was free to fly wherever she chose to, and none dared defy her because, well, who wants to tell a dragon no at the risk of losing their lives? And so the pair continued to grow and thrive in each other's presence, and their early years together were marked with overwhelmingly positive growth. Dreamfire grew to become a splendid, if not massive, dragon in her own right, and though she wasn't as big as Quicksilver, she was swifter than him. Rhaena and Dreamfire were inseparable, and it could even be said that they were dependent on one another, because when Rhaena turned 18, she was taken by her father King Ennis on a royal progress without her dragon or her favorite companions. It was only when the latter joined her that her mood improved slightly, though to be honest, if she had had Dreamfire, she'd have flown away in an instant. Rhaena continued to dote upon her siblings, friends, pets, and dragon until the year 41 AC rolled around when she was betrothed to her younger brother, Egon. 
Aegon. Rhaena and Aegon had always expected this betrothal, being Targaryens, and had always been close since childhood. They did not protest the match, but this was where things started taking a bad turn for the royal family, because the High Septon did, and his rantings against Rhaena and Aegon's marriage led to the Faith Militant uprising. Neither did Rhaena's father help things by not reinforcing his rule or his son's rule with their dragons. King Ennis was notoriously weak as a ruler, and had named his son heir to the Iron Throne despite him not having a dragon of his own, when Rainer, his eldest child, had Dreamfire and Anus's brother rode Beleriand the Black Dread himself. While this might not seem important to you, it was crucial for the power optics of the day that the Targaryens use their dragons not just in war, but also during peace. The dragons had forged the Seven Kingdoms together, and it was only their sight that could hold it fast. Aegon the Conqueror knew this, and so he never made a royal progress without Beleriand. But Ennis had commanded his children to go on their progress, dragonless. Though Rhaena had often flown Dreamfire with her brother in their youth, the king declared that if his son and heir rode a palfrey to the castles of lords, high and low, and his wife flew a dragon, then Aegon would be seen as weak. In hindsight, Ennis should have forced his son to choose a dragon as soon as he was old enough to do so, because his thinking couldn't have been more wrong. Without Dreamfire to prevent the common folk from acting out, act out they did, pelting Aegon and Rhaena's progress with words and dirt alike. The princess had to rein up her horse and confront the Harangas at one point, which already stood her brother up more than Dreamfire could ever have hoped to, but the extent of Ennis's folly was revealed when Aegon and Rhaena were besieged by poor fellows at Crakehall. Deprived of Dreamfire, the queen-to-be and her brother could not escape the castle to safety, and the news of his children having been cornered by the poor fellows was too much for King Ennis to handle. He passed away three days after receiving the news, and this is when all hell broke loose for the Seven Kingdoms, because the Dowager Queen Wisenya Targaryen brought back her own son to rule, Magor the Cruel. She was a wanderer and a rescuer, Dreamfire during the reigns of Magor I and Jaehaerys I. Dreamfire was in the dragon stables of the Red Keep when Rhaena and Aegon were besieged at Crakehall, as the dragon pit had not been constructed yet. When Magor returned to Westeros, he immediately immersed himself within the Faith Militant Uprising, and thus Rhaena and Aegon were able to avoid his attention for a while. He survived a trial by seven, won two great victories in battle, burnt the seats of several houses, and took yet another wife before finally marching on the seat of the Faith. Old Town. When Mago arrived at the city with Balerion and Vagar, he found its gates open and decided to spend half a year there to dispense justice. It was during this half-year that Rhaena and Aegon seized their opportunity to put together an actual resistance to their tyrannical uncle. When the besiegers left Crakehall to go attack King's Landing, Rhaena and Aegon fled to Casterly Rock, where they were extended guest rights by Lord Lyman Lannister. It was here that Lyman's wife Jocasta deduced that the princess was pregnant, and Rhaena's twin daughters, Arya and Rayla, were born at the seat of the Lannisters. But once they got word that their uncle was holding court at Old Town, Aegon and Rhaena Rainer decided to attack. They sneaked into the capital with help from supporters within Magor's court who had grown weary of his cruelty, but they didn't come here for a coup, they came here for dragons. Rainer was reunited with Dreamfire, who had laid two clutches of eggs in her absence after almost a year apart, and Aegon finally claimed a dragon of his own, his father's mount. Quicksilver. Husband and wife departed King's Landing side by side, only this time on Dragonback, and suddenly Aegon the Uncrowned's claim started gathering supporters like flies. The prince raised an army 15,000 strong when he marched from Pink Maiden Castle, and he had Quicksilver with him, but he refused to allow Rayna to fight in the war with him, which meant Dreamfire couldn't fight either. Had he decided to trust in Rayna instead, he might have even managed to accomplish what he had set out to do, because two dragons are always better than one and especially when you're going up against the Black Dread. Aegon the Uncrowned and Quicksilver died in the battle beneath the god's eye, and Rhaena Targaryen was never the same. She quickly gathered her daughters and fled for Lannisport with Dreamfire, and then arrived at Fair Isle off of Case. There, she disguised Aerea and Rayla and sent them away with trusted friends to places even she knew not where. But Rhaena herself had nowhere to hide, for she was accompanied by Dreamfire wherever she went, and so both Dragon and Rider spent the better part of four years being hosted by Lord Mark Farman. During this time, it is said that Rayna grew fond of Mark's second son, Andro, but the maester at Faircastle noted that it was actually Alyssa who was the princess's true love. Dreamfire and Rayna stayed at Faircastle, waiting for something to happen, and in 47 AC, their fears came true. 
Magor commanded Reyna to present herself to the capital, for he had decided that he was going to marry his niece in a triple ceremony. Reyna arrived to King's Landing with Dreamfire, and many expected her to make a show of defiance, but they were proven wrong when Magor's third wife, Tyana, produced Erea and Rayla as hostages to ensure Reyna's cooperation. This is how Ennis Targaryen's eldest child became a black bride. Reyna would say in later years that she tried to kill her uncle on their wedding night, but we don't know how much truth there is in that statement. What we do know is that had Dreamfire not been in the city, Reyna might not have survived for too long. When her youngest brother, Jaehaerys, put forth his own claim to the Iron Throne from Storm's End, Reyna decided that she was going to help her brother take out their tyrant of an uncle. In the Black of Night, when Megor was sleeping, Reyna stole his sword Blackfire, the ancestral Valyrian steel sword of House Targaryen, and also took her daughter and Megor's heir, Erea, with her. She made for Dreamfire's stables in haste, and after unchaining her pale blue steed, took off before anyone could have been alerted to her actions. By the time she arrived at Storm's End, Jaehaerys outmatched Megor in every aspect of war, including dragons, because with Dreamfire, he now had three. After Megor was found dead upon the Iron throne, Reyna returned to the capital with her daughter Erea and her siblings Jaehaerys and Alisan, who flew upon Vermithor and Silverwing, respectively. Dreamfire then carried Reyna to Old Town, where her baby brother was coroneted by the High Sept, and she herself allegedly swapped her own daughters. With her eldest, Erea, now becoming Jaehaerys' heir until he had a child of his own, Reyna parted with her daughter and her brother at Highgarden to return to Fair Isle and marry Andro Farmin in a small but quick ceremony. This act angered most people at court, including Queen Regent and Reyna's mother, Elisa Valerian, and Hand of the King and Protector of the Realm, Lord Rogar Baratheon. Her brother, the king, was most pleased by the news, though, and dispatched gifts to her and her new husband at once. Dreamfire resided on Fair Isle for a year with her rider and was the unofficial fifth head of the four-headed beast, as Queen Rayna would often take her lady companions flying with her. The Queen in the West was forced to leave her safe haven in 50 AC. However, when Mark Farman passed away, his arrogant eldest son Franklin became Lord of Fair Isle. Franklin brusquely dismissed Rayna and her companions from Fair Isle, including his brother Andro, but demanded that his sister Elisa be left behind with him. Rayna departed Fair Isle that same night on Dreamfire, but did not deign to acquiesce to the Lord of Fair Isle's second demand. Elisa Farman took ship with Reyna's companions, and they traversed the Westerlands and Riverlands for a while, enjoying the hospitality of many lords, high and low alike. But it was during this adventure that Reyna realized just how precarious her own position was. Wherever she went, the lords were courteous enough to not refuse her retinue, as she had been a queen once but their real interest was Dreamfire. Many would ask after how she was raised, how she was tamed, and how one might raise a dragon themselves, should she come into possession of one by some miracle. Their eyes were filled with lust for power whenever they saw Dreamfire, and even old friends were not about to spare Reyna their grasping fingers. When the four-headed beast arrived at Castle Rock, Lord Lyman Lannister's bastard son, Tyler Hill, tried to woo Reyna into marrying him and setting aside Andro, whom he constantly berated. Lord Lyman got a bit too cosy asking questions about Dreamfire and the rearing of dragons, and Lady Jocasta made so bold as to suggest that she should gift House Lannister one of the three eggs she was carrying with her, perhaps all three, to show her gratitude for all their help. When Rayna refused all of these things, Lyman offered to outright buy the eggs. But Reyna knew better, and when her brother Jaehaerys was marrying their sister Alisan for a second time, she flew to their wedding to make her grievances known. Jaehaerys understood the deeper meaning behind Reyna's words and agreed to grant both her requests. He gave her possession of Dragonstone as her own seat and restored her daughter Erea to her, despite not having an heir of his own body yet. The king's wisdom was no match for a daughter's stubbornness, a lover's insistence, or a scorned man's fury for all three of those things conspired against Reyna during her residence at Dragonstone, turning her sourer than she had been. The Queen in the West became the Queen in the East that day, but Jaehaerys would recall during Reyna's eulogy that she died the day their brother Aegon perished on the battlefield, and neither was the effect of Reyna Targaryen's plight lost on Dreamfire herself, who practically became her sole comfort and companion thereafter. She was a seeker and a symbol of grief. Dreamfire and Reyna Targaryen's Final Years Though Reyna Targaryen had managed to protect her family from the greed of lesser men, she was not able to save her immediate family from itself. 
The eggs that Dreamfire had lain on Fair Isle all hatched at Dragonstone, and Raina urged her daughter Araya to pick one for herself, but mother and daughter had lived too far apart from one another for too long to be reconciled with such a small gesture. Elisa Farman, who had been Raina's foremost companion of all, disliked Dragonstone so much that she began fighting incessantly with the woman she purportedly loved, and Raina's husband Andro was wallowing in an entire vat of self-pity by the time he decided to man up and do something about it. So it was that after spending three uneasy years at Dragonstone, Raina Targaryen's court scattered like some foreboding prophetic storm. The first to disappear was Elisa Farman, who stole three dragon eggs from the Dragonstone hatcheries and fled for Pentos. Raina was furious at this betrayal and fearful that someone besides the Targaryens could end up possessing dragons if Elisa sold them to the wrong person. She immediately flew to King's Landing and informed Jaehaerys of the theft, with brother and sister drawing up war plans in case dragons turned up elsewhere in the known world. Raina was ready to mount Dreamfire to war for the first time in her life, but unbeknownst to her, her former lover had already sold her eggs to the Sea Lord of Bravos and crossed half the world in her fabled ship, Sun Chaser. If community theories are to be believed, then the three eggs that the Sea Lord bought from Elissa were the ones that Illyrio Mopatis gave to Daenerys Targaryen centuries later. If Dreamfire had laid that particular clutch, then that would make her the mother of Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. It's a cool theory, but it's also highly unlikely because the eggs that Elisa stole could have been lain by any one of the numerous she-dragons that House Targaryen had seen before her. Meraxes and Vagar both came before Dreamfire, and by the time Raina took possession of Dragonstone, Silverwing was old enough to lay eggs. So there are too many ambiguous variables for us to confidently proclaim Dreamfire as the mother of Denny's dragons, but it is a likelihood that, if it were true, would be the definition of a full circle moment. Raina's troubles did not end with the fact that three prophecy eggs were stolen from under her nose. That same year saw her jealous third husband, Andrew Farman, use a poison called the Tears of Lys to murder all of her companions and then commit suicide to spare himself the gelding Raina had ordered for him. She instead had his carcass chopped and fed to the dragons at Dragonstone, including Beleriand and Dreamfire. That miserable year of 54 AC ended with Raina's daughter, Araya, fleeing from Dragonstone with no less amount than the Black Dread himself. It is said that the dragon bond goes both ways, and that the rider and their mount can feel each other's strongest emotions. If that were true, then Raina was enraged by Araya's flight because Septon Barth noted that when she arrived at the capital, her dragon rained down on the Red Keep like a storm. Raina took Dreamfire to King's Landing as soon as she had realized what had happened, thinking that was where her daughter would have gone, but found herself greeted only by her brother, the King. Raina waited at the capital for Araya for seven days, and then she mounted Dreamfire and started searching for her lost daughter by herself. For an entire year, Raina Targaryen roamed the skies of Westeros looking for her daughter, with no one but her dragon to keep her company. Raina traveled as far as the Barrowlands in the north and the Red Mountains surrounding the river Torrentine in the south. Dreamfire was seen flying over the Fingers, the Mountains of the Moon, the Westerlands, the Reach, as far west as the Arbor and even Fair Isle, where Raina threatened Lord Franklin Farman when he disrespected her on her visit she did not find a trace of her missing daughter. The Queen in the East was at Greenstone at the start of 56 AC when she finally received word that her daughter had returned to the capital with Beleriand and was suffering from a weird disease. But before she could see Araya again, she had already been cremated. Raina Targaryen was too late to see her daughter in her final moments, just as she had been too late to come to her mother's side when she passed away. The Lady Alyssa Valerian had birthed two kings and given two children to her second husband, Rogar Baratheon, but after Raina married Andro without her leave, a rift had opened between mother and daughter that was never healed in their lifetime. When Alyssa died in the birthing bed, Raina's rage was considerable. She arrived at Storm's End half a storm herself, and told Rogar that if he ever dared to take another wife, she would personally slay him with dream fire. Raina told the Lord of Storm's End that if he ever took another wife or mistreated her half-siblings, she would make a second Harrenhal of Storm's End. Rogar laughed her off in front of his brothers, but he never married again. When Raina arrived in King's Landing after receiving that ill-fated raven from her brother, she lost all semblance of the humanity she once had left in her. She took charge of Araya's ashes, mounted Dreamfire, and interred them on the clouds, for Araya had always wanted to fly.
After that, she retired to a life of quiet isolation at Harrenhal with her brother's leave. Raina would often fly Dreamfire by herself and would visit her only surviving daughter, Rayla, at Old Town once a year, but other than that, she had largely fallen out of the public eye. Raina Targaryen died in 73 AC at the age of 50, with only the retinue and household of Lord Magor Towers to attend to her demise. Her ashes were interred at Harrenhal itself. Dreamfire took wing from Black Harren's folly and returned to King's Landing, where she made a lair for herself in the Dragon Pit. She resided there for half a century before she was claimed by another Targaryen princess who most likely had dragon dreams. The Mount of a Queen Whose Reign Wasn't Meant to Be Dreamfire and Helena in the Dance of the Dragons By the time Helena Targaryen entered the Dragon Pit to choose a dragon for herself, Dreamfire was already pushing a hundred, though you wouldn't be able to tell because of just how slender and small she looked for her age. We know that if a dragon is given enough food and space, it will grow endlessly, eventually bumping up against the square cube law, after which their growth only gives them diminishing returns. But here's the thing. The Dragon Pit is the perfect place to incubate a dragon's growth. It is said that every Targaryen dragon born after Vhagar and Meraxes was much smaller in size than them. Caraxes's generation has him as its largest, and he's about half the size of Queen Wisenya's feared war mount. But conveniently for Dreamfire, it prevented her from growing so big that she might not have been able to fly, much less fight. She remained smaller than even Vermithor, who was born well after Dreamfire had been hatched, but this size and speed advantage would end up being for nothing, as she was claimed by yet another dreamy Targaryen. In 121 AC, Dreamfire bonded with King Viserys Targaryen's second daughter, Helena who was his second-born child from his second wife, Alicent Hightower. Not much is known about Helena and Dreamfire's relationship because unlike the dynamic she shared with Raina Targaryen, their pairing was short-lived and ill-fated to begin with. Helena had never been an especially belligerent person. She was the only one of her siblings who did not resent their half-sister Rhaenyra, and she was said to have a timid disposition besides perfect for motherhood. The only time Helena took flight on Dreamfire was when she was traveling, which she wasn't doing a lot of in the first place, because the only reported sighting of the pale blue she-dragon was at high tide for Lainor Valerian's funeral, when Driftmark was dubbed the new Valeria for the dragons that had gathered in attendance. But Dreamfire and Helena did share a strong bond because while the queen-to-be never showed any special interest in her siblings, the dragon was beloved to her, and Ryder and Dragon would often go flying together. Dreamfire was in the Dragon Pit when Helena's husband and brother Egon was crowned king by the Greens, and it was there she remained after the birth of Helena's children. But it would be the Queen's death that would truly upset her, for it is said that when Queen Helena died, Dreamfire roared and thrashed so angrily that the entire Dragon Pit shook and she snapped two of her chains in half. The dragon that had never once taken part in an official conflict as a weapon of war became the last line of defense for her kind when the shepherd's ravings brought a stampede of dragon slayers to the great stone stable. Though there were other dragons present inside of the dragon pit and they did do major damage to their attackers, none did half the damage the Dreamfire did. She broke free and used flame and claw to mow down hundreds of attackers, if not thousands, but the sea of men was too much for her to tackle by herself in a restricted space. Dreamfire flew directly at the dome of the dragon pit during the final struggle of her life, and her last action saw the death of thousands of mad Kingslanders and all the dragons with them. Dreamfire was the last Targaryen dragon to truly live in the dragon pit, because after her, only one dragon would remain to the royal house of Westeros, and even her fate is uncertain at best. She had served as the mount of two queens and never once was used to make war, but went out much like her species was wont to do in fire and blood. Marvelous Verdict, Dreamfire's Legacy Before Robert Baratheon took the Iron Throne, the throne room of the Dragon Kings would be decorated with the skulls of their once mighty steeds. Though we do not know for a fact that Dreamfire's skull in amongst that fabled 19, it would make a lot of sense if it was given the fact that she perished in the capital itself. She was the second Targaryen dragon born after Aegon the Dragon completed his conquest and lived longer than many dynasties have managed to exist. She saw more of grief and death without entering battle than arguably any other dragon, and would have been remembered as the brutal blue beast had she let her flames melt Storm's End. Her life was spent bonded to melancholic riders whose lives could have held more meaning had the Dragon Lords remembered how to accurately interpret their own signs and portents, but she died as her old empire had, in madness and war, 
in fire and blood. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.